to speak to you about uh, catastrophic landslides. Um, not too technical. I, I want to talk more about some of the human interest uh, things associated with it. And I've subtitled this, My Journey to Viant and Tinsaugen. So I'll be talking about those two landslides. Um, and it just did work before. So technology is great when it works. Well, let's see if we can, we are locked up. Oh, we've got it going now. I've got it. I don't know what I did, but it, I moved it. So I'm going to talk to you about two catastrophic landslides this evening. Um, and, and a landslide is simply the movement of mass of rock and debris down an earth, down a slope. It just is occurring over gra due to gravity. That's a, a gross oversimplification of what we have. There's numerous classifications that we could use about landslides. Falls, topples, spreads, slides, flows. They get complex when they combine a couple of those. And lots of what we work on are co combinations of those. Um, we often look at a velocity of movement when we look at these. Um, and so we can start down here with something really slow. And you know, I spent um, 15 years working in South Dakota. There's a lot of landslides in Pierce Shale out there. <clears throat> that fits into the story a little bit. Most of those are really slow. Um, move sometimes just a few inches a year. You get a lot of rain, they might move a little bit more. Um, we get moderate ones. And then something that moves really fast is 10 feet per second or about three meters per second. I want you to keep this top part in mind, something that's extremely rapid because we'll talk about these two landslides and how fast they move. So catastrophic landslides are ones that, um, are, they're violent uh, disturbances of nature, often very sudden, massive physical damage, maybe loss, a lot of loss of life with it. I'm gonna talk about two infamous landslides. They're described, both of which occurred suddenly. They lasted only minutes but they caused horrendous amounts of damage and loss of life. <clears throat> the first occurred in 1963 when the side of a mountain slid away in just a matter of, of about 30 seconds into the side of the Viant Reservoir in Italy. It caused a surface wave to overtop the dam, killing somewhere around 2,000 people. They never really did get a final count on that. And, and I was fortunate to go to the 40th anniversary of that. And so that's my pilgrimage to Viant, but I'll, I'll set it up a little bit more on it. The second is the Gonsaugan landslide that occurred in the Philippines in Southern Leyte in February of 2016, or 20, 2006, in which a mountainside gave way um, suddenly, you know, Somewhere, but they estimated originally between 1,000 and 2,000 people were killed. And the number is closer to the, the lower number when they got the final count. Well, how did I get interested in landslides and then catastrophic landslides? Well, firstly, I'm a geotechnical engineer and landslides combine everything that we have of interest. There's slope stability, there's the soil properties, there's seepage, um, just, investigation, and then failures, we try to understand what went wrong so that we don't make the same mistakes uh, moving forward. So when I was a, a PhD student at Virginia Tech, I was fortunate to go to a conference at Purdue University in 1985, where four dams or four uh, slope failures were discussed. The Baldwin Hills Reservoir in California, the Teton Dam in Idaho, failed in, in, on first filling in 1976. A billion dollars in damage occurred downstream when that flood wave hit. The Malpasset Dam in France and the Viant slide that we'll, we'll talk about this evening. 
I renewed an interest in reservoir landslides when I moved back to South Dakota in 1988. Um, and my interest in Missouri River dams and the reservoirs comes quite naturally. Um, I was born in North Dakota when my father was working on the Garrison Dam in the 1950s. He subsequently moved down to South Dakota and worked on the Oahe Dam. So the dams were always in my blood. Um, and when I moved to South Dakota, I became very interested in studying them. There's four dams in South Dakota, uh, and there's a lot of landslides along the reservoir slopes. And I was trying to understand those because if you ever cross the Missouri River, whether it's in North Dakota or South Dakota, anywhere on a bridge, there's a landslide on the end of the bridge. It just, that's the way it is. And it, you know, the dams, the Oahe Dam, when they first made the first cut to put the Oahe Dam in, they cut it at three to one and it failed. They cut it at four to one and it failed, or six to one and it failed. Finally, when they cut the abutment slope back to nine to one, it stood up. It was in pure shale and the stuff just is not very strong. So I, I spent my years in, in South Dakota trying to understand reservoir landslides, which brought me to the Viant slide to try to understand what went wrong there. And that brought me to an individual named Eddie Bromhead, who's a geotechnical engineer um, in the United Kingdom. And Eddie was invited to give a keynote talk on the 40th anniversary of the Viant slide. And I had been corresponding with him for many years on reservoir landslides, and he invited me to come along with him as his guest. And it was my pilgrimage to go see this famous reservoir landslide and to perhaps try to better understand it. Now, how many of you have been to Northern Italy? Very many, well, some of you. The Dolomites are beautiful. It's a beautiful country. Um, and so the trip, just not even, if you discount what I was doing professionally and looking at this, we had a lot of fun. Uh, one side story is we decided Eddie and I, one night it would be his turn to buy dinner and the next night it would be mine and we'd um, change over. Well, one of the first night, I think it was either the first night or the third night, it was my turn to buy dinner. And, but Eddie ordered the wine. Oh, it was a really good wine. When we got the bill, we found out why. He ordered an 80 euro, bo 80 euro bottle of wine, which was quite expensive. He said, whoops, I didn't think it was that expensive, Vern, but it was really good wine, okay? Anyway, we, we went there and here's the location of it. You know, Venice is, is down this way, but you come up here and we have the Longer Arni Longer is the, where the Viant Dam is, here's the Viant River coming in from Erto, Longarani right here. So that places that the Dolomites are in this area. Beautiful scenery, we'll see a little bit of that. Some background on this dam. Studies for the construction of this started in the 1920s, just like they did for the Missouri River dams, for the Tennessee Valley Authority dams. So all over the world, people were looking to develop hydroelectric power. Well, they didn't get built until post-World War II, and they obtained authorization to build a dam 200 meters in height, okay? So keep that height in, uh, in your mind with a capacity of 50 million cubic meters of water, okay? And this was part of a larger hydroelectric scheme just like we did in this country, we, we made many dams on these big rivers and would harness the, the power in many different places. They did that also here. There were 10 dams built. The Italians though interconnected all of their um, dams with water. And that will come back as part of the story of why the Viant Dam is still in place with that. So here's the, the Viant reservoir, dam and reservoir down here. It's a tributary of the Piave River. Um, 
and it was dammed between 1957 and 1960. The dam was constructed was by was constructed as 276 meters. What was that one two slides ago? 200 meters. It was authorized at 200 meters and constructed to 276 meters. I've tried to find out why. There's not, you know, somewhere along the line, somebody had to okay it, but the official authorization is off, uh, you know, has never been found, at least to, to my understanding. And the reservoir had a volume of 160 million cubic meters. We more than tripled the reservoir size in doing that, okay? The valley of the Viant River is very narrow. It has steeply sided deep canyon cut into dolomitic limestone. There's some interbedded shales perhaps. I was talking with Daniel Pradell before, just you know, during dinner. Um, one of the things that we'll find here, the geologic investigations for this dam were probably not as good as they should have been. So a doubly arched dam 276 meters high was built. So here's the original design going up to that height. Here's the height as constructed. And that constructed height led to a reservoir three times the size. And the dam designer was Carlos Semeza. He became suspicious of rock, possible rock instability at an early stage of the construction. There were some minor slips that occurred and there was a geologic survey in 58 and 59, construction had already started and they were quite pessimistic. Um, there are indications of a mass of 250,000 cubic meters of rock slowly creeping down the, the, one of the reservoir slopes. And it had not yet been inundated, okay? And filling of the reservoir started in early 1960 before the dam was finished. Rock masses began to move due to the rising water levels and the water levels kept going up. And then there was an early landslide in 1960, in November of 1960. Only about 300 meters of, uh, in breadth came down the um, side. Um, it, it was the cataclastic um, malm layers. Um, you know, so it wasn't all that large, 70,000 cubic meters. And this is a photo of that, you can see you know, limited slide here. Here's the, the dam down here in the lower part of the picture. We can see the sediment that's been deposited here for this. Um, you know, there wasn't, this wasn't at full water level yet. And then we see the back slope um, above this. And that's what was eventually going to come down. But a small landslide precipitated this. So when we put water up to the toe of a slope, we sometimes like to think that it adds some weight to it, but if it is a water sensitive material, it's going to weaken that way. So conditions prior to the failure, once the dam was completed, the water came up. We can see that failure scarp over here on the left side of the, of the photo, um, nice water level, pretty mountains. We don't see them as beautiful. These were um, from the era. Uh, 1960, so black and white photos. On October 9th, 1963, 275 million cubic meters. Just think of it as cubic yards. It's a little bit, cubic meters, a little more than a cubic yard. That's a lot of material. Traveled at high velocity into the reservoir above the dam, displacing 50% of the water. It was at full pool when this happened. The movement lasted about 45 seconds. It was fast. The rock came down incredibly fast at velocities of about 30 meters per second. Remember that scale I showed, 10 meters per second was extremely fast. So this is even quicker than that. It's off the charts of how we, we map our velocities of landslide. This sent a wave 260 meters up the opposite slope and 100 meters over the crest of the Viant Dam. Now I'm using meters because that's what all of the literature is in. 
just take a little over three times that. 300, a wall, 300 feet of water went over the top of this dam, okay? Here was the original 1960, outline of the 1960 slope failure. Here's the reservoir. So it goes back up quite a ways. Here's kilometers. It's not a real long reservoir. Its purpose was to generate hydroelectric power. It's not like our Missouri River dams that are set up for fishing and recreation. So there's not as much of that on it, but it's set up for that. Here's the outline of the 1963 dam in, in the red, the larger red that we see here. The green over here shows the flood, limit of flood that went on. And we see the water went upstream. It wiped out these five villages here. Longararo was, was right in the chute coming out of the dam straight west of it. And it was obliterated by the wall of water that came out. Here's a couple of photos. Um, air photos afterwards. The one on the left, we can see kind of in the upper quadrant, we can see the, the arch dam there. There wasn't any damage to the arch dam. The concrete arch dam was constructed very well. The water went up and over it. It filled in the entire reservoir. All of this now is just sediment that came down the hill slope. Here's another close look. Um, the reservoir here, the water. This is this is looking out towards where there was the city out here. The water's drained away. The city was obliterated. And this is looking from the city of Longarone, looking back there. I don't think you can quite see the dam there. I've got a picture that I took 40 years later that, that you can see the dam in. And people out here um, looking for anything, but the entire city was, was wiped out. This is the first view that I had coming in, driving into the city um, in, in 2003. Beautiful countryside. Um, you see these steeply uh, steep sided slopes coming in. And this is from the hotel I was staying at. You can see right in the center, you can see the concrete arch dam. One could take and walk up to the base of it. It was about a, a little over a mile walk to do that. Um, there, um, things have grown back, the city's come back, um, everything is, you know, almost, you know, you, you wouldn't know that there had been this disaster 40 years previous in terms of looking at things. I took, I spent a lot, of, I was there a few days, I was able to walk around and take some pictures. This is all landslide debris right here. There's a road built onto it. Um, this is all, the, the white area here is all the, the scarp face of the slide that came down the hill, down the mountain. Lots of material filled it in. Here's the arch dam. There's uh, no water uh, back behind this, but it's still standing. We got a tour um, as part of the conference. We could go in and, and tour the dam. I've got a couple pictures up close of it. Um, they're still using it because the whole piping system that we saw on an earlier slide is still coming through the dam here. And they can, they still make it, you know, it's still part of that system. This is from Castle, which was a, a little village up on the other side of the, of the slope. Um, and, you know, we see a, a nice view of it, but this again is, is all landslide material here that we're looking at. And then, Okay, so then we see the monuments and the buildings. Um, and this was, again, part of the 40th anniversary, but they've left this building. This was a, one of the lower lying buildings. And this building had a water damage and the roof blown off of it. Um, most of the rest had been reconstructed, but they left that one kind of as a museum to what, was, to what happened um, in 1963. Now, part of the um, conference and then the memorial that went along with this, um, I had the opportunity to engage through Professor Bromhead, an, an Italian man um, who was miss he was gone from the city the day that uh, the, the flood hit. He was off working. 
and he lost his entire family. And so Eddie was asking him the questions and, and relaying the answers to me. And his emotions were as raw 40 years later as I think they probably were when he came back. And we as engineers sometimes deal in facts, but when you deal with the emotions, it just strikes you. And it was, a, as I said, it was my pilgrimage to Vion that to learn what happened not only to the nature, but what happened to the people. And they have a, a, a gathering every 10 years. So there was one in 2013 and there'll be another one in 2023. Um, in terms of, of looking at that. Um, it was extremely moving and something that I've never forgotten a, as an engineer. One of the saddest parts about this, so this was reproduced for the 40th anniversary. This was a telegram that was delivered to Casso, to be delivered to Casso and Irto on October 8th, 1963 to evacuate the cities. It did not get there before the flood hit. They had instrumentation in the mountainside indicating that there was some movement occurring, but it was all within what us engineers would say, well, it's, it seems reasonable. It's not moving very much, a little bit. And then to have a sudden occurrence like that was beyond all expectation something that was sudden, unforeseen in terms of looking at it. I drove upstream, um, went to Erto. There's some water ponded up here. Um, they do drain it if it gets too high, but here's the, the failure surface there. Um, back in, in that time, I didn't have a panoramic camera, so I took three pictures and then later could stitch them together to make your own panoramic. But again, just a beautiful area to visit um, with that. As I said, we went to the dam. Um, the arch dam is still in place. You can see they've taken, there were some attachments here. They've taken some of the things off, but you know, no damage to it. Um, this is standing on the dam, looking back to the Longaron, and you can see the city in there. This is a pipeline of water coming from other dams upstream. So it's still uh, being used in, in that regard. So engineers have done a lot of, and geologists have done a lot of studying of this particular failure. Um, there's a lot of potential failure mechanisms that have been put forth. It was a reactive agent slide, might've been progressive failure. I mean, some very, prominent geotechnical engineers hang their hat on the progressive failure. Shear strength loss due to friction heat. Where'd the, fri where'd the friction come from? Well, some movement. Seismicity, that one's pretty much been debunked, but it's been looked at. High initial stresses in the rock that were relieved. Poor fluid, fluid vaporization. A first time slide in brittle clay. We know that that happens. Um, ancient landslide dam. Landslide dams, when an old landslide it comes down dams a river and then it's washed away and it might've occurred before. Uh, Self-accelerating rock fracture. Was clay present or not present on the failure surface? This is the big debate. Um, you've got uh, Mueller is a, was a, one of the top engineering geologists in Europe. Um, thinks that clay wasn't present. These other people, no clay present. These are all well-known either geotechnical engineers or engineering geologists. The clay was present. There's a lot of this. And there's a lot more that probably could be put on this list. Um, in 2018, there was another big update. People are drawn to this failure to try to explain it, but nobody's really come up with the definitive reason for why the, uh, how the, why the slope failed. So what's the importance of a failure like this? It's a large volume, high velocity. We get great destruction and great loss of life. It marked a turning point in the relative emphasis of reservoir slopes. Up until this time, there was not much attention paid to reservoir slopes. We built the dam and didn't worry, didn't do too much investigation. 
And that's come back to haunt us, okay? Um, you know, in the Missouri River, there's landslides up and down the, the, uh, the entire reservoir. Vern Bump was a 40 year employee of the South Dakota DOT. He lived in Pierre. He used to tell me, you want to study reservoir slopes, go fishing out in the Oahe Reservoir. And so I tried it and you could see the landslides, a lot of them out there, okay? Us engineers and geologists are obliged to explain why the reservoir slopes di are different from Vion, okay? Other countries are having problems with this. The Three Gorges Dam and Reservoir in China is having tremendous problems with reservoir slopes right now because we haven't heeded the lessons of understanding that we put a lot of water on water sensitive geology that we have problems because that's why if we can't explain Viant, how can we be confident of our evaluation of other reservoir slopes? And in my view, we can't be. We haven't yet learned the lessons. Previous reviews are somewhat disturbing in the gross inconsistencies of the field data slide behavior and results of the analyses. They're all over the place. If you wanna pick one of those mechanisms, I can find a paper that's gonna support it for you, okay? And then we're gonna find another paper that debunks it. And that's disconcerting to me as a longtime geotechnical engineer. We want a little bit more certainty than that. But with these catastrophic landslides, it's difficult to get to that final step of why did they occur? And we go back and lean on, well, maybe it really was an act of God in terms of doing things. The second slide was the Gunsaugan um, slide in the, in the Philippines in Southern Leyte. And note the date. Why, part of why, I, you know, when, when I was asked to do this, it, oh, I, I know something that happened on February 17th. So this occurred 16 years ago. And um, Gunsaugan, is right down here in the southern part of the Philippines. And Tacloban is the uh, largest city in, in Leyte. And you know, Manila is, is up in the next chain of islands um, up above. And uh, you may have heard of Tacloban. It, you know, I, I can't remember the year, but there was a massive hurricane, uh, um, what do they call them in the Far East? Hurricane that goes through there. The what? Cyclone? Typhoon. Oh, Typhoon. Yes, that's right. Sorry. Typhoon went through there and leveled that city. And um, the other part of this, I was part of a, a National Science Foundation reconnaissance team that went and visited this landslide a, a few months after it occurred. Um, we went and um, you know, we're doing that kind of reconnaissance to see what you could learn from it and everything. We flew into Tacloban, um, you know, stayed overnight there. Um, San Pedro Bay, are there any World War II history buffs here? A few. Um, this became a little personal to me too. Uh, right here south of Tacloban is where MacArthur walked ashore. And there's a, a monument to him doing that. Um, the other part of it, there's this little town down here called Dula. Now, my wife, Ruth, is here this evening. Dulog is where her father in World War II came ashore in the Philippines. So these things become personal when you go there, um, the other part. So we land in Tacloban, we come down and it's a four hour drive on not always concrete or bituminous roads, a lot of dirt roads. It was a, you know, not a onerous trip, but some of the roads were not in the best of shape. So we were going to an area that um, had a lot of poverty. In fact, when we made our arrangements, we took a satellite phone because we didn't know what the communication would be like in, in getting there. So that's all part of the story in doing this. So what we see here on the, the photo is the Cablian Bay, St. Bernard is the city on the coast where we stayed. Uh, Gunsaugan is out here a few
few kilometers up the, the river. And you can see the slide area here. Uh, this photo was taken um, the day after by um, some, and I, I'm a little unclear if it was Navy people or Marines, but out of a US military helicopter. The first people, first responders were three US Navy ships. There were some exercises going on um, with the Philippine Army uh, with Marines, uh, US Marines there. 6,000 US Marines came down to help. Okay, so that's going to play into the story that once again, the US came to the aid of, of these people here. Okay, so here we see one of the helicopters going um, towards it. We took this picture from another helicopter. We see the material up at the top of the slope came down and then it fans out. And here's the river area. There were several villages right in this area. And the people live down in the valley. You see a village over here. You see a lot of green space. There are a lot of rice paddies there um, in terms of looking at things. And when we got there, I can't quite see it, unfortunately. Let me see if I can get rid of that. There's something at the top. I want to get rid of. I'll tell you. Up at the top of this sign, what it says is Internet Cafe, San Juan, four kilometers. What we were worried about was not being able to communicate. And what, when you go to essentially a third world country from our country, things are much different. They never had landline phones in that area. But guess what everybody had even 16 years ago? They all had cell phones and they had internet. So I, we, were all, we were able to communicate. We didn't need the satellite phone that we brought. So you go to the disaster area, you go to St. Bernard. I moved the mouse, so now it won't pass, let's see. Okay. So this is in, in 2006, and I made two trips there, one in 2006 and one in 2007. You can see the river in front. They had already erected um, a memorial to the people there. And the people here that are, are resting, this was the crew. These are the people that we hired to help us get up and down the mountain, to, to lead us around. And you know, we were paying them, I, it's really painful to say, we'd pay each of these people about $5 a day. But they were related because they were living on a dollar a day. Most of the time they were making only a dollar a day. And when we left on each of the trips, if I had any extra money, I passed it out to all of the people. And so they, you know, they were very good helpers with it um, in terms of looking at it. And so you see that from where we come from, they live in poverty but these were among the happiest people that I've ever met. You know, they had been through this disaster and lost, almost all of them had some story to tell of um, loved ones that they had lost, but they were happy to be alive, happy to help us out, see if we could help uh, learn anything from it. When I went back in 2007, there was a lot more developed of, of the memorial in, you know, this has become a, quite a, an infamous landslide that um, it, several papers have been written about. But you can see the, the types of living conditions that the people had. And then here's the landslide in the background with this. <clears throat> Again, the river here and the water levels way down. We were, like I said, we were there a couple of months after this had occurred. Um, it was flooding when it occurred. We'll talk about that in a bit. You see the clouds up here. It's a pretty rainy area. They get a fair bit of precipitation. 
But this is the scar that's on the slope. Again, this was a sudden, uh, sudden occurrence uh, occurred in the morning. Um, this is one of the, the grad students that was with us. Beware health hazard. So this was our in, in 2006. There were still soldiers there preventing people from going back out because the people were trying to go out to find anything of their belongings or of loved ones. And they had, excuse me, they had to keep the people from going out there. There's about 30 to 50 feet of debris right here underneath this. This is, you know, we hiked up the, the slope. Um, you know, the, those of us from the US, we didn't carry anything. The temperatures were typically in the 90s, 100% humidity. I was lucky I could make it up the slope sometimes, but we had to have water. So those porters were carrying gallon jugs of water for us. And if we wouldn't have had that, we wouldn't have made it. But we got up, you can see quite the, the you know, scars that this left. We took a terrestrial laser with us to do scans of it, compared the 2006 to 2007 scans. You see the, the slope scar. I'm gonna just point out that one of the people that took us up and down this had a, his, his family farm was right here and he would walk up and down this every day. And he was an older man. He was not on the mountain at the time that this happened, but his entire family was, and he lost them. They were living right on this edge. And to hear him talk about that, and then still be willing to help people come and, and look at it. I'll, I have a picture of him a little bit later. So this just gets you a, a close up of the very top of the hill, um, very coarse types of, of material, um, but there was a mixture. Again, mixture of fine grain materials, sandy materials, rock in there, very smooth failure surface. So it's highly fractured rock. This is a, a picture in 2006, standing up on the slope, looking out over what we saw. So this is all you know, pretty recent, you know, it was only two months ago that the, the um, failure had occurred. You can see the water, we see that village in the background um, looking at this. So contrast that with the next year from a, not exactly the same location, but a pretty, um, pretty close. I wasn't quite as high in 2007. The vegetation's all come back uh, growing. Um, but there's no development back in this yet. And, and I don't know if they've, they've gone back in there now the 16 years later. For this one, 15 million cubic um, meters of material. It was mixed rock, mud and rock fragments slid down Mount Kabak. It's characterized as a rock slide debris avalanche where it begins with the failure of a rock slope and then proceeds to take in everything else that goes down the slope. So when it starts, it just keeps going. The movement lasted only two minutes. Reached estimated velocities of 27 to 38 meters per second. Again, that scale at the top was 10 meters per second. The slide materials moved about 800 meters vertically, down slope three and a half to four kilometers. The result in debris flow covered and destroyed five villages and killed you know, more than a thousand people. Um, I just recently looked it up, the official death toll of 1,126. Okay, it's a lot of people to lose in an area. Here's a photo. Um, I've got some from some of the Filipinos um, from going up at top. This is what the, the slope surface looks like up in top. We can see what a demarcation. The vegetation on on one side, just the rock slope on the other. What was the trigger for this? Well, it was long thought that it was earthquakes. And right here is where the failure occurred. And there was an earthquake at 10.36 a.m. 
here. There was one at 6.22 a.m. over here, 10.36 and 10.36. But this failure occurred at 10.23, 13 minutes before those landslides, before the earthquakes. It's now thought that the slope failure triggered the landslide or triggered the earthquakes, that that movement along this fault zone, which is a known fault zone, did that. But so we look into the seismicity. Uh, more likely the trigger being rainfall. Southern Leyte receives about four times, it received about four times more than normal rainfall before the slide. Um, hard to see, this is, this is the yearly rainfall starting with um, January and February is 484 kind of, this is over a 10 year period. It goes down in the summer, our summer months and then goes back up. This particular site had had 750 millimeters of rain in the previous 10 days. Most of it, over half of it coming in the previous two days. So it was most likely a rainfall induced landslide or, or slope failure in terms of looking at it. But why this particular location? All up and down kilometers and kilometers of that same slope, it didn't fail. We as engineers, we as geologists can't answer that question yet. Why did a catastrophic slope failure occur right there? There were some conditions that we, we weren't aware of that occurred. You know, here's just some depictions of, you know, it started up here, it comes down and the rocks move. Here's kind of the main flow. There's some side flows coming out as it hits the flat areas. We see some of the size particles here. Here's a um, large block. So we see somebody standing here to, for scale with this. That's a big rock coming down the slope, isn't it? move that. So we've got the main flow coming down, looking at that. This is a group of 12 year old girls. So, you know, we were in that, by where that cross was, that's where we would gather um, at the end of the day, because we had enough people, we're going to different parts of the landslide. And I was sitting there um, trying to recuperate, drink some more water, and these girls were coming from school and they spoke really good English and they wanted to engage me. I was the first real American they had ever met. They wanted to talk about the characters that they see on TV. That's what they knew about the USA was TV, okay? And look at them, they were all smiling, happy as can be. It lifted my spirits to, just to chat with them. And what you find out when you go to something like this, where disasters occurred, compared to what we have, these people at least monetarily don't have a lot. But I, I think I have to tell you, I think they're happier people than we are. And they aren't pursuing as much money as we are. And so it gives you a different perspective. And what I learned in talking to the people that, at the resort that we were staying at, and, and I've traveled as I know many of you have around here, but you go to other parts of the world, everybody wants the same thing. They want a better life for their children. Um, they want peace in the world. We all want those kinds of things. And so it, 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 these kinds of going and looking at these things brings us closer together to those kinds of things. Um, this is the guide that um, one of them that took me around quite a bit. Um, he was carrying the water that I needed. And uh, so we got to know these guys pretty well. This guy was a real character. How many of you have had coconut water coming right out of a fresh coconut that somebody has scaled the coconut tree to go up and bring down? Anybody? There's one back here. It's pretty good stuff, isn't it? You know when it's really good? when it's 95 degrees out and 100% humidity and you've been drinking water all day and then you get coconut juice. It's a lifesaver. It was really good. They would take these, they'd take their machete and break it, you know, cut off the top and just say, drink it. And you, you could drink a couple of those really quick. 
when you're real thirsty. And then, you know, they're having fun doing that. So this is the older gentleman who I referenced earlier um, who lost his family. And he's the one that showed us most of the, the places up here. And uh, he was in his 50s, as I understood. But he could go up and down that mountain. If I go up and down at once, I'd need a whole day just to rest. It was grueling um, to be doing that. This was the, the team in 2006. This is Marty Guterres. Uh, he was at, at Virginia Tech at the time. I'm, I'm in the back there. Uh, this is the Filipino geologist that was showing us around. This is the, our guide, and then these are our, our porters helping us out. And a graduate student from University of Florida who brought the terrestrial LIDAR for us to use with that. And you can see it's nice and green in the background. You like to, I'd like to tell you that it was fun, it was enjoyable, but it was very humbling. I'm glad I went both times. I learned some things, but you know what? I learned more about people and how they react to things than I did about anything technical. And I think that was the lesson that I came away with. So let me summarize these two slopes. Catastrophic landslides are sudden, unforeseeable events that not only have catastrophic effects on the landscape, but also catastrophic, catastrophic effects on humans. And humans can bounce back. Often the determination of the causation of these failures remains elusive, despite intensive investigation by geotechnical and geological specialists. And us specialists are drawn to such events to learn and to understand what happened so that we can try to reduce and perhaps predict such occurrences. And I'm kind of sorry to say that we haven't gotten very good at predicting catastrophic landslides yet. And that's why they keep their name catastrophic, unfortunately. So with that, I, I thank you for your attention. And uh, I wanted to talk about two landslides Unfortunately, they had a lot of death with them, but that's not the story. The story is that we recovered from it, the people recovered and then they move on and that we can learn something from them. So um, I'll be more than happy to take any questions that you might have.